Blue Volkswagen, your battery's going to be dead by the time church is over if you don't go turn the lights off. It's a dark blue. You got it? All right, so you're in good shape then. Second one is, uh, there's a national holiday this week. Anybody know what it is? No, no, Stacy Dutton's birthday is today. <laughs> Say amen. You need to let her know how much she, you appreciate her. She has to put up with Brother Gary. She has to put up with Brother Tim. She has to put up with Matt, with Crystal, with you. I'm on. Y'all give her another praise, Lord. Tell you appreciate her. Amen. I thank God for faithful, faithful people like her who serve the Lord so willingly. And just so often goes way beyond the bounds of expectation to help in so many different ways. Thank you, Stacy. We appreciate you. We really do. Amen. Praise God. This is the last in the series on Destiny Dynamics. As we get into it this morning, uh, I would hope that you've heard most of them. For those of you, they still are available online. So you can go back and on our YouTube channel or the Facebook uh, and, and watch them and get, get an idea of what's going on with these. But these are very important. I don't even like to use the word principles anymore because they're more than just principles of understanding the will of God. They are dynamics. In other words, the Bible is not like any other book, and what it says is not like any other book because this is a living book. It is a dynamic book. It's, it's alive, and it's powerful. The Bible says it's sharp and quick, and it, it, there's, there's a, a phenomenal ability within the context of Scripture. When you take it and apply it in faith to your life, that book is incredible what God will do in your life with it. The Bible says it's by these promises that we literally participate in the divine nature. So think about that for a moment when you're talking about the dynamics of God's will and purposes for your life. Every one of us, as we said throughout the series, we always facing decisions. We make a thousand little decisions every day. And uh, sometimes even those are bad, you know, but we've just been in the habit of making those bad decisions. Uh, we've got to get a hold of the fact that God is really at work in our lives. We've talked about Ephesians 2.10 that says, you know, that uh, we've been recreated in Christ Jesus. We're new creatures in Christ. Eight and nine of that chapter says we've been saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. We can't boast. We didn't do this ourselves. God's done something for us. And it says that God has also predestined, predetermined, has in mind already a plan and a purpose for your life. All right? I mean, just get a hold of that for a moment. I think we say it so often, we don't really, really capture the full blunt of what's being said. God has something for your life that he's working out and that he's doing. Now, bottom line, let me tell you, that what he's working out gets down to the fact that we're all being transformed and conformed to the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's making us godly. He's making us like Christ. So that's the will of God for all of us. But in that process, there's there's a will, there's a purpose that God is doing in each and every one of us that he wants to, to feel, full, you to fulfill in your life. And in fulfilling, discovering the grace, the peace, the victory, the joy that is all part of that. So we talk about dynamics in the context that these are things that God is doing. Many of them are, are, are things that uh, are, are, are things, uh, if you would call the Bible a thing. Some of them are personalities. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Those are in your favor if you love Jesus, Amen. Uh, not only that, you think about this, there's those imperceptible, unseen forces that uh, are also personalities. We've talked about demons. We've talked about Satan, the God of this world, and how he, you can be sure he's plotting today. As much as God has a plan for your life, and once you discover and live in the joy of that plan, uh, you can be sure the devil's got a plan for you. He's already chalked it out on the board, and you know, he's laid it out in detail, and he's already put uh, forces in action to work against you. And if you're not discerning, and if you don't learn how, what the, the Bible has to say about your life and discovering God's voice and will and purpose in your life, you could easily wreck everything, all right, and not even willfully, so to say, be thinking about participating in what Satan's been doing against your life, but still be a participant in it. That's a, lot of, that's a mistake that a lot of Christians make, that they will willingly participate, but not even knowingly participate, not realizing that these, these forces and these factors are out there that affect your life either negatively or supernaturally and spiritually in a very positive and in a very real way. So let's talk about these. Of course, we've started each sermon in this series with a, a definition. Webster puts a, a, a dynamic as something that is the underlying cause for change or growth. We've talked about those underlying causes, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, you know, and for growth. There's also things that don't want you to grow, those negative ones that we also have dealt with, not just Satan, the world system itself that opposes God, you know, that worldly principle that's out there, uh, your own flesh, be opposed to the will and, and the ways of God. 
Uh, the Encarta Dictionary says that the force that tends to produce activity and change in any situation or in any sphere of existence. So dynamics, they're in every area of our life, but you must understand that there are some forces that are in operation in your spiritual life that you want to learn to resist on one hand, but also to cooperate with on the other hand. And we've talked about a lot of these things, all right, already. And just to rehearse you, those were, we talked about all those external things, you know, of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, how he's operating, what his plans and purposes are, how he moves in our life. We've talked about the Word of God and the influences of the Word of God and how that works in our life. But and those were the, the external things. Re, the last weeks have been dealing with internal issues of how the Lord is working in our life, the action dynamics on our part. And by that, these are things we need to respond to. If God the Father, God the Son, Spirit, His Word is available to us, all these are out there presently working. How do we, how do we react to that? And how do we really understand if God's working in our lives and what His purpose is in our lives? So we've listed these, and really you could make these action words, but so it wouldn't just be fellowship dynamic, it'd be the fellowshipping dynamic, that we need to be walking in the light daily, fellowshipping with Jesus daily. And the Bible says as we walk in the light, we, we have light, all right? So we get more understanding. The more you walk with God, the more understanding you have. The less you walk with God, the darker you're going to live, all right? The lights aren't going to be on so clearly. The Word is a lamp and a light into my feet. I have this I have to fellowship with that. We've talked about the obedience dynamic, that there really is a powerful dynamic of me saying yes to the Holy Spirit, yes to the Word, yes to God. That dynamic of the Holy Spirit's presence in my life, all right, at that point. Uh, some people say, why is not God working in my life? Well, you're not obeying. You're not letting Him work. You're not responding to Him. You're not, you're not welcoming that dynamic of the Holy Spirit to work in your life. We've talked praying. We've talked fasting. We've talked about the, the element of, of delighting ourselves in the Lord and what that really means. And, and, and it, Though it is in the realm of fellowship and, and that, it goes a step further when you really start thinking about what it means to delight yourself in the Lord to really take joy in God's presence in your life. I think that's, that's just another dimension. It's another element of, of the fellowship thing and the prayer time that we have with God. But it's just really relishing, so to say, your relationship to God, that you're really enjoying walking with Jesus. Is that foreign to you? You know, I think about that for a moment. You're really enjoying walking with Jesus. If there's anything you ought to do in your life as a Christian... You've got to learn, and we've talked about the, the context of people talk about practicing the presence of God. That's what it really means. You're just realizing his presence, and you're relishing it. You're enjoying it. You're, you're, you're delighting in the Lord. You realize the value of his presence in your life, and it's something that's active, that you're, you're ongoing. But today, we're going to wrap all this up with how God wants us to hear. And as we talk about this this morning, we'll also talk about how does God speak to us, all right? But the hearing is so important in response to all that God said. You know, it, it is of vital importance that we learn how to really tune in or to hear what God says to us. You know, the Bible says in Matthew, in that chapter, it's mentioned here, it's chapter 7, where he says, you know, uh, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine is like the man, you know, and acts on them, by the way, <laughs> not just to hear, but that's what the word literally means, you hear and act, that you may be compared to the wise man. I don't know about you, I'd like to be compared to the wise man. The wise man did what? The wise man found a secure place to build his house upon. He had a foundation for his life. Too many people have no foundation in their life. They're just building on what they want, what they think is best, what they've logically figured out. They put a pencil to a piece of paper, and God's not really part of their life, all right? And look, Jesus is saying that's a foolish way to live your life. The reason why, he said, because you're going to, have, you're going to face problems, be trials, there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be hardships. He said it's like, it's like when the wind begins to blow and the rain begins to fall. Guess what happens? If it keeps blowing and the rain keeps falling and the floods come up, the house that doesn't have a foundation is washed away. All right? But if you have a foundation, if you're learning to build on the right foundation, your life is going to last. It's going to mean something. It's going to be important. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to be something that brings you personal joy. And it's going, to be, well, it's going to be the abundant life that Jesus promised us. Not just life, but life. But if you are not building. And how do I do that? I'm hearing what Jesus is saying to me, and I'm acting. That's the wisest thing you can do in your life. And as you hear Jesus speak and you respond to him, then, then, then you're building on something that's going to last your life. You're making a difference in your life. You're responding to these dynamics of God's work and his will, and his, and his grace in your life. 
And all throughout the parables, there's an illustration of Matthew 11, 15. These are these words. If you have ears to hear, and how many of you have ears? Well, God gave them to you for a reason, to hear, all right? Hear, you know, kind of ends with ear, by the way, all right? Hear what the Spirit says to you. And the idea here is not just, a, oh, I heard that. Listen, I, I, I'm corrected by my spouse occasionally. I'm sure you've never deal with that issue. Where she goes something like this. Did you hear what I said? Were you paying attention? Did you ever tell your kids that? Did you hear what I just told you? Nobody has ever said that to their children? All the time, right? Did you, are you just wanting a whipping? <laughs> no, I'm not wanting a whipping, by the way. But hey, hearing, it's, it's not just catching a collective sound of frequencies, hitting your tissues and your eardrums and passing down to whatever that little station tubes and all those things are in your ear so that some sound is produced in your brain. No, it, it has the idea that goes much deeper than just to catch the sound waves or something, you know. It's to really listen. In fact, Jesus uses these words as he addresses the churches in Revelation. He's given that final word to the churches, the book of Revelation, those first chapters. Jesus is talking to seven unique churches. Now, I believe those are churches that were historically real and alive at the time, all right, and were active. But also I think they have a prophetic picture as well. But the idea is that in each of them, and the message is, I'm speaking. You need to hear what I'm saying. It's like this. Pay attention. Pay attention to what the Spirit of God is saying to you. It literally means to give ear is a word that's used throughout Scripture a lot. It means to pay careful attention. There's another term in Scripture that talks about, you know, stopping up your ears. You know? And uh, the people don't do this normally when I'm preaching, but I can almost see them doing it. You know, it's kind of like talk to the hand. You know, if you're going to talk, these aren't here, but the hand might listen. I doubt it. Yeah. You know, la, 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 la. <laughs> no. God said, don't be that way with me. But I know that when truth is preached and people are hearing truth, I have a tendency when something comes across my heart and the word is spoken to me that I'm kind of, oh, hit the brakes. I don't know if I want to hear that. That's the worst thing we can do. I'm stopping up my ears at that point. You don't want to stop your ears, you know, if the Lord's speaking to you. In fact, let's do something very unique at this moment about our ears. Let's just bow our heads and pray something like this. God, I want my ears to really be open today to hear what you want to say to me. You do that? Just go ahead and bow your head just for a moment. Just pray that simple prayer. Lord, I, I pray my ears would be open to really hear what you want to say to me personally today. In Jesus' name, amen. We really ought to start our days like that, shouldn't we? We ought to walk into church with that mindset and that attitude. We ought to enter our stu Bible study group with that mindset. Hey, speak to me, Lord, however you choose to do, whether it's a, whether it's a song, whether it's something that's said between us all, or whether it's something said in the welcome announcements or in the message. I, I just want to hear what you have to say to me, God. I, I am desperate to hear. I don't want to stop up my ears. The Bible talks about it this way. Another place it uses the terminology, incline your ear. All right, which suggests, you know, the desire to understand. I really, not just here, I really want to comprehend. You know, we talked about in Proverbs, there's that terminology a lot where the Lord says, you know, to pay attention, to listen carefully, make your ear attentive to wisdom, the scripture says, and your heart attentive to understanding. So that, so the idea here is, I want you, but I not only want you to speak to me, I want to comprehend what you're saying to me. Now, this is an attitude of teachability. It's an attitude Whatever that light's doing, turn it off or fix it. All right, it's driving me nuts up here. That one, right there. <laughs> but it's an attitude saying, Lord, I really, really desire to get a grip on what you're saying to me in my life right now and what you're doing in my life right now. I want to capture what you have to me. So we have ears to hear, all right? So to hear what the Lord says and, you know, to hear what God says to us, it's important. We say, well, then how does God speak to us? Well, I know there's people who say that God speaks to them in all of a voice, but that's not according to the New Testament. That's not what we see. Could God? Yes. Will God? I don't know. Have you heard God speaking in all of a voice? I would probably drop dead of a cardiac arrest at that point if he did to me. He knows my frailty, so he knows how to speak to me. But he doesn't have to do that anymore. He spoke to the prophets that way and dealt with them. You know why he doesn't have to do that, like at Moses at the burning bush? Because he's now made us new creatures. They didn't experience in the Old Testament what we experience in the New Testament. That's that transformed inner person, all our sins forgiven. They were looking forward to the cross in faith, but now the Holy Spirit lives in us once we've committed our life to Christ. All right? So he's in us, and with that comes that new 
Just if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and all things become new. And, and it goes on to say, and all things are of God. All things are of God. What are these all things? My ears, my mind has been renewed, my eyes have been renewed. I see things. And by that, I can see something, but I, I can perceive something. I might be in a situation before that might have confused me, but when I have spiritual eyes, now I look at things differently, and I can say, I can see what's really going on here. Now, when I'm not paying attention and when I'm not really hearing, then a lot of times I'm confounded by what's going on around me. You've been that way, right? And I really get confused by what's going on. But God's given you the ability as a new person in Christ Jesus to comprehend and to know when he's speaking to you so you don't have to say, I hope I don't know if that's God. Because I'll, I'll share you as we walk how we can know something's God, that it becomes real clear that it becomes God with this new, this new life. Because first of all, we've come to know Jesus Christ. And the scripture says, because we know Christ, we have the capacity now. It says in the past that God spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, all right? But in these last days, he's spoken unto us, how? By his son, Christ Jesus, and he is the Lord of all things, right? So now I have a relationship with Christ. And so since I have a relationship with Christ... As this new person in Jesus, I can hear what God has to say to me. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, all right? And I know them, and they follow me. See, the shepherd is speaking to the sheep, sometimes prodding them with a shepherd's step, but they're following in obedience to the shepherd to go where he's leading them into the pastures to eat, all right? He said, but my, my people, those who come to me, they now have the capacity to know my voice, all right? They know my voice, and I give them eternal life to them, and, and they won't perish, but listen to this, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. What a great promise from God. Listen, if you've never taken time to just chew on that verse for a while, just take that one home and memorize it tonight, all right? God will bless your life with that verse, because there are some dynamics that really do impact us on every kind of level in our life. But the idea is simple. God has done something in me so that I know it's him when he speaks to me. My sheep hear my voice. Now, if I were to call you this afternoon and you picked up your phone and maybe you didn't know the number, that it was me calling, and I knew you didn't know the number, I'm the kind of guy who might mess with you a little bit. You know, I might jerk you. Hey, this is Mr. Johnson from the IRS. I didn't get you your returns this year. We'd like to see you in the office immediately. You know, and send you into a little bit of cardiac arrest of your own. But, you know, I can't do that to my wife. I can't call her up and fool her. Now, I used to early on, we, you know, in, in, in first years of our marriage, I could call and mess with her like I was somebody else and make up some weird voices. And, you know, she doesn't do that to me. She's not as weird as I am, but I do that to her. But now I can't do it anymore. It just don't work. She knows it's me. I, I can't do it to Stacy most time I pick up the phone. She, you know, she's always hearing me grab about something around here, so she knows my voice, all right? So I can't mess with it. Gary, I probably couldn't fool him because you're working with that people all the time. You know their voice. Those people, are, when they try to mess with it, you know it. Why? You spent time with them. You know them personally. You've been around them a lot. That's the idea with Christ. The more we spend time with him, the more we're around him, we have a relationship with him now, we know him, we ought to be able to discern his more voice more readily. He speaks to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, John, he says this, you know, he who is of God hears the words, you know, of God. In other words, if you have the Lord, you have now this ability, all right? If you don't know the Lord, if Christ is not in your life, you don't have the ability to hear God. Now, you, there's a lot of people who say they know God, but they're just, they're, they're not really come to this place of this new life in Christ. They, they're religious people. They're good people. They, you know, they're, they're not robbing banks and all that kind of stuff. They probably go to church, but they've never really come to faith in Jesus Christ where they've started this new life of now I'm following Jesus. All right. They've never come to that place. You know, they may have their name on the church roll, but they really just, they've never been, as Jesus said, born again, born of God. You must be born of God. And those who are born of God, guess what? They hear the words of God. So now God's giving you this capacity to hear what he says to you. In Matthew, it says, while Jesus was speaking, behold, a, a, a bright cloud shattered them, and suddenly a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Catch the last two words of that. What's it say? What's it say? I can't hear you. What's it say? Hear him. Hear him. It's kind of like, listen to him. The Lord says, I am speaking loudly, clearly, and boldly to all that are present for you to know this is my son. You need to hear what he's saying to you. 
But the idea, again, don't just kind of listen to it. It's the inclination to do it. You listen to comprehend. You listen to do, to do it, to respond. So he speaks to us through the living son, the living word. But he also speaks to, to us through his word, all right? As the spirit takes the word of God, guess what? We have the spirit living in us now. He illuminates the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for what? For doctrine, so we can learn doctrine, to learn with the truth of God's word, how God moves, how God operates, what's going on in the world around us, so we understand. And it's also given to us for reproof. There may be some areas that need to be reproved in my life, that I'm being disobedient. You can be sure that the word of God, the Holy Spirit of God, the voice of God will take the word of God, speak to my spirit about what needs to do. How does he do it? He does it through the word. Sometimes it's me just reading the word. Sometimes you might be sitting in your Bible study group, and that word comes in a corrective word. Sometimes it may be in the sermon. Sometimes it may be in private, just reading your Bible. You had to happen with the the Lord speaking to you, and it becomes clear. It's, he's giving you instruction in the righteous life you ought to live. So you can be complete. So you can grow up and be what God's called you to be, be mature in Christ. And so that you can be thoroughly, I love this, thoroughly equipped for God's plan in your life, for God's purpose in your life. He puts it this way, for every good work. Same terminology used in Ephesians about God has prepared us for good works that he has pre-planned, pre-ordained, and set aside for us to do. He said, I see what God's will is, but I don't think I can do it. He says he's equipping you with the word. But if you're not in church, you're not listening to the word, if you're not in Bible study, you're not listening to the word, if you're not in private time and study the word of God, you're not going to get it. It's going to get right past you. You're going to maybe hear it, but it's going to be like, huh? Or, I don't know if I like that. Or, I don't want to hear that. So he speaks to us. God is speaking to us. We need to hear. We need to hear the Lord Jesus. We need to hear his word as it's being brought to our hearts and minds. And he also speaks to us by the indwelling spirit. I don't have to be in church. I don't have to be reading the Bible. God will just speak to my heart. All right? And in my heart, he begins to make it clear of his will for my life. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? All right? But even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. And what has he done? Catch it. It's in the yellow letters. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So we can know God's will. So we can know what God's done for us. So we can know how God is operating in our life or in our present situation. God has given us his Holy Spirit. Now, we've talked about the Holy Spirit, and we've talked about the Word, and we've talked about the make of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, but now here we are in this internal part of it saying, I need to hear now. He is moving, but what good is it going to do if I don't hear him? And I don't have this mindset, predetermined attitude in my heart and life that says, I want to hear what God says, and I'm ready to do what God says. There's a lot of people say, well, let me hear, and I, <laughs> let me think about it. I'll make my mind up after I hear what he says. The Bible says, let not that man think he'll receive anything from God, James chapter 1. He's a double-minded man, and he's unstable in all his ways. That's a powerful word, is it not? If you go back and forth between what your will is and God's will is, you're probably not even going to hear what, really what the deeper things of God are that are being said to your life. So the Lord speaks to us through his indwelling spirit. And in fact, listen, God speaks to us through others. Children, honor your parents. Why? Because God is using them in your life. It could be through leaders. How many times in Proverbs does it talk about listening to counselors, listening to those who are around you, listening to spiritual leaders, listening to teachers, listening to teachers? We need to have ears to hear. But if you go with this mindset, I'm going to listen, but if I don't like it, I'm shutting it down. You're, you're just making yourself a world of trouble. You know, that's why the Bible says you pray for those that are in authority over you. Pray for kings and leaders, spiritual authorities. Why? Because God uses these things in our life to speak to us. So I want to make sure I'm hearing the right thing. Amen? So what, am I, what do I need to do? Uh, pray. I can remember this. I, one thing is, as a pastor, when you're trying to teach people the, the priority of praying and praying for those in authority is when you hear stuff, and it depends on, you know, which, which ruling parties in the White House at the time. Well, that's not my president. I'm not praying for him. Might be been Obama. It might be Trump or whatever. I ain't pray for all in authority. All right? 
Doesn't mean you have to love them, embrace them, like them, kiss them. But you do pray for them. Why? Because I, I begin to understand there's an important principle. God's at work on a lot more levels than my little tiny world in front of me. But understand that what he's doing in the bigger levels will filter down and impact my life. So I need to be praying. Most of rather just complain or blog. <laughs> Amen. So he speaks through others. Now, I've kind of put these in an order, so to say. And so I filter through if this is the will of God, I, I'm going to get counsel. I want some instruction. I want some guidance, all right? So I've gone to the Word. I'm open to the Holy Spirit. I'm listening to the, what the Lord might say in my heart and life. And then I'm beginning to say, you know, God, reveal your will, your words, your ways to me, whatever this decision I might be facing. And then I'm going to be paying attention on these other levels. He might speak to you through a circumstance. Not always, but sometimes. Now, this is where most Christians get wrong because they put this as the number one thing if something's the will of God. Can I get a witness? <laughs> In other words, it must not be God's will if it's uncomfortable. It must not be God's will if there's no air conditioning. Can I get a witness over there, Gary? <laughs> Just go on submission trips, you know what we're talking about. It must not be God's will if it's going to require sacrifice. Or if it's something that's hard on me or something that might be difficult or something I just don't think I can do. All right, so it's not the top thing on the list, your circumstance. But I do believe God can use circumstances, all right? But I'll look at all these other things first. But if I'm still having trouble determining, I say, well, maybe God is saying something in this particular circumstance. You know, I think you see Paul and Barnabas when there was a conflict that was going on between them and a decision made. I believe that God was trying to direct them in different passages through the sermon. They didn't, they didn't leave each other bitter, you know? But God was doing something unique in the situation. He'd be paying attention to the circumstances, what needed to take place. So, yes, God can speak through circumstances. There's another way that he speaks to us, through the impressions, all right, of the Holy Spirit. That God has the ability that in the daily course of my life to really impress my heart and my mind about something. And it's usually if it's from the Lord, I really can't escape it. You know, I've used this before, and, and, and some people have come to me and say, man, I really want to go to Israel. I'm just not sure if I should or if I can afford it or this. I said, why don't you ask the Lord about it? All right? And ask the Lord, if you really want me to do this, just put it in my heart. And I said, if it stays there, then it probably, you know, it's, if it goes away and sometimes, you know, God really wouldn't. Because God will let you know. He'll confirm things in your spirit if something is from him. All right? And that, that's just one illustration about so many areas in your life. You say, there's just this impression. I, I'm just not sure. Well, God's not going to change his mind about what he impressed you to do, so he'll keep it there. Amen? Until you just choose to say, I willingly will reject that, not do that. So the Lord not only speaks that way, but he also speaks through burdens. And that's a little different than oppression because burdens is almost like a, almost like a weight, you know. It's like a, a burden of something you're carrying, you know. And, and it operates not so much in your mind. I'm not talking about a worry or a doubt, all right. I don't know about something going on, and let me just use for lack of better terminology, a gut feeling, you know. It's just there. And it's a burden you have. It might be about a situation or about a person or people or some situation going on somewhere. And you just have a burden about it. And you need to be sensitive to the Lord when those burdens come. I've discovered also that the world will try to impose burdens on you. All right? Uh, it's like not every situation or every need that I see means that I'm supposed to go take care of it personally. You know? And sometimes the world has things, especially, you know, if it's, if when it's time they need money and they're going to present this and they present nice little pictures of all the situations that are just desperate and terrible and the poor, you know, or some dogs in the shelter, whatever it might be, that they won't put all the pictures on you. You know, I, I love animals, okay? So I, I don't do a lot of shelter support, but, you know, I, I, I'm more interested in people and, and God, you know, there's people out there going to take care of the shelters, all right? I, I, that's their department. I have my department. You've got your department. What has the Lord been burdening you to do? What ministry, what way to serve him, what way to touch somebody's life? And sometimes he burdens just a lifelong burden. Sometimes it's just an independent individual thing. The Lord's laid something on your heart to go do. Does he want you to do it every week, every day? Maybe not. Maybe so. That's, you know. But we're talking about usually there's a way that something comes upon. In other words, every need I see doesn't represent a call from God. 
you know? Young Christians are real bad about getting to this, and they get so overloaded with so many things going on in the church, they just got to be a part of everything. You don't have to be a part of everything, all right? And now there's competition in the church. Well, if you're in that Bible study, well, you need to come to my Bible study too, and you need no, chill out, guys, all right? God's going to bring there who needs to be there. He's going to put on their hearts what they need to be doing, how they need to be serving. What they need to be. You all need to be here, obviously, on Sunday morning. We have corporate worship, and you all need to be in some group study together. That's obvious from Scripture. You can't get around that. Do I have to be in the one that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday? No. Amen. Somebody say it a little louder. Because some of you are wearing me out. I'm having to be at all your meetings. <laughs> But God gives us a capacity to hear and to know what that is. But I need to be doing, serving, responding in some way. There's that passage. It's also out of 1 Corinthians. It says, these things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. In other words, this isn't about what you can logically figure out. You know, This is about what the Holy Spirit teaches. And he will take and compare spiritual things with spiritual. In other words, how do I know this burden? Well, I can compare spiritual things. Or can he listen for the voice of God? Is he confirming it through his word? Do I have peace from the Holy Spirit? You know, so I, I've got an abundance of ways to confirm if something's from God, all right? The natural man, he doesn't, he doesn't get this, all right? If you don't know Jesus, you don't get this. But if you know God, God's giving you the capacity because you have the Spirit of God, and it's not foolishness to you. If God did speak to you about something that might be foolish to somebody else, it's not foolish to you because you understand what God's saying to you. So if you're spiritual, God's saying, you have the capacity to look at things. He's things. Is this God? Is this not God? Should I do this? Should I not do this? Because God's given you his Holy Spirit. That's, that's a powerful verse of Scripture, is it not? Where God's just making it very clear to you, I'm going to speak to your heart. I'm going to guide your life. I've given you the mind of Christ. All right? You're not going to tell God what to do, obviously, but you can know what God is doing. And if there's this, this, this confirmation after confirmation from the Holy Spirit of God to guide you into all these things so that you very clearly know. But the discernment has to be there. That's where you use that word judge. We judge things. People say, Christians shouldn't judge. We judge all things. We don't judge people, by the way, all right? <laughs> that's God's business. He's the judge over folks. You're going to hell. You're going to heaven. That's his department. That's not yours department, so quit telling people to go there. All right? <laughs> that's the Lord's business. It's not yours. All right? And I can't judge people's motives. But I can't hear what God's saying to me. And I can have discernment. In, in Hebrew, it says the word of God is that living, it's that two-edged sword. It, it helps dis, help me determine if something is spiritual or if it's just soulless. What's that mean? I may see a need. I may have a burden in some regard, but it may not really be one from the Lord. It may just be something my mind sees and my will looks at. And I've had a lot of people who, who've done this, especially, again, it gets back to immature Christians who said, I called me to the full-time ministry. I tell you, everybody that comes to know Jesus in their, in their life is going to feel the call to full-time ministry at some time. Because <laughs> we just have this burden to do what God wants us to do. But it doesn't mean you should be vocationally serving. We all serve the Lord all the time anyway. But he may have that for you in your life. But he'll, he'll help you determine that because he's given you his word and he's given you his spirit and it is able to sort out what that is just mental, emotional, soul issue, that, or that which is spiritual, that which is from God. Do you understand that? Is this just me or is this God? And so what's he done? He gets back to that dynamic of the Word of God. But here's what the kicker is here. I've got to be listening. I have to have ears to hear. There has to be a willingness in my life. And listening doesn't mean, well, God, tell me, and then I'll think about it, and I'll pray about it, and I might or I might not. That's not listening. Listening is you tell me what to do. I'm on it. Do we listen with that, kind of, with that kind of passion? God's the one who can give the capacity to, have, to be a discerner of your thoughts and the intents of your heart, to know what's God, to know what's not God, and to get direction according to his will and purposes of your life. So discernment, you know, is learned ultimately more and more discernment, the capacity to discern more is learned through Scripture because in Hebrews it goes on to talk about solid food belongs to those who are mature, all right? We're not drinking milk all the time. Now we're starting to chew on some meat of the Word of God, all right? It's for those who by reason of use, all right, you've been chewing on God's Word, you've been taking it in, and you've been obeying God's Word, so you've been using God's Word. You have now exercised 
the ability you've been exercising by your right choices, by discerning right and doing right, guess what's happening? You're maturing your discernment. You're, you're getting more of an ability to discern. And how do you get the ability to discern? By discerning. You grow in that. And the more that you choose and you're perceptive, then the more you see and the more you know and the more perceptive you are. It, let me use a physical illustration of this. You know, uh, my birthday's also pretty soon here. And I was born, I, this may be a shocker to something, I was like a little baby. Right? A little baby. A little fat round thing, heads twice the size of my body kind of thing. You know what babies look like, right? I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. I couldn't even clean my own mess up. Somebody had to come in and embarrassing. Tell me, tell me, all right. Somebody had to change my dirty stuff and wipe me clean. Anybody else like that here? You all came out all right doing the potty and all that yourself? No, you didn't, all right? You had to learn to do all the way. But here's the thing. You couldn't even do that. You, you, had, you had the ability. You had the muscles, you had the arms, you had the hands, you had everything. You couldn't even walk, much less talk. But what happened? You started using the muscles, all right? One day came along, and all of a sudden, you were able to push yourself up off the floor. And that's a great day because the floor is, that's a nasty place to live. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, there's a lot of nasty stuff on the floors. I don't know, maybe your house is cleaner than the one I grew up in. There were six kids. There's a lot of nasty stuff down the carpets and the floors. But so when you can push yourself up and not breathe that drug in, that's a great day, all right? You know, y'all have all seen the pictures. A little kid popping himself up first time, big grin on their face, big ball guys, you know. Y'all just didn't have a childhood. And then the day came, you know, you kind of start finagling those knees and legs and ankles and pushing around. All of a sudden, you're up on your knees and your hands at the same time. That's just awesome. What an experience, right? But you'd never got there to push the upper torso, right? And then one day came, you, then you're motivating, you're walking, you're crawling on all fours and you're getting around and getting into stuff and breaking stuff. It's just a cool new world, all right, of discovery. And then it's not too long after that, Months, maybe, a year or so. You learn to get your little behind up directly, you know. And you're a little weak, but you learn how to lock the knees finally into place and use the ankles, and all of a sudden, one leg goes in front of the other, and you're, you're doing your thing, and you're walking. And what's happening? It's by reason of use. The more that you do it, you don't come out running, all right? But you learn to run. You don't come out deeply spiritual in your new life. You're spiritual, all right? Anybody that's born again is spiritual. You say, well, he's not very mature. It doesn't have anything to do with maturity. If you're saved, you're spiritual. You're not carnal anymore. You have a new life, and that new life is spiritual. You need to learn the spiritual world and what's going on in the spiritual world, or your life's going to be wrecked completely every day. Most people have no concept of the spiritual, no discernment what's going on. They just fall right into one trap after another. Satan's laying, you know, his little fiery darts at them. They're just taking them on, going down in flames because they don't perceive what's happening. And they don't care about obedience or spending time with God in prayer or reading the Bible or even going to church. They don't see any of that, even though they may be born again and they're spiritual people. They're living not the spiritual life. They're living a carnal physical life. And it's, it's kind of like being that, that steel ball in the pinball machine. You know, you pull back the thing, and boom, it goes through the little flap and just starts beating off one thing after another. That's the way most Christians live life. Boom, 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 boom. And somebody hits you from a flipper from the back. <laughs> Y'all can edit that part off the film. <laughs> Amen. And this is where you live in life. It's reaction. Oh, look here. Oh, they did that. Or they said that. Or this happened in my life. What am I doing now? I can't go with time. And their life just, it's reaction. That's all it is. They don't realize that God's delivered them into a new life. And if the bumpers are going, they can just move off of it in the right direction. And so that the opposition that does come, God just calls it to work in their favor because they know how to respond to the spiritual world they're living in. 
instead of react on a purely soulish, emotional, mental level. Life's on a deeper level. So we learn by learning, by obeying, by surrendering and hearing what the Spirit of God says to us, all right? You know, he speaks. I'm going to go right past this because you aren't listening way too slow this morning. Maybe it's my theatrics. I don't know. Hearing. I'll close with these four quick points. There's a parable of the sower of the seed. We're probably all familiar with it. In Matthew 13. Preached it many times in the Crusades. Jesus is speaking. And he's given a parable that kind of reveals quickly that there's a lot of people in church, a lot of people in the religious world, who really don't know the Lord. In fact, he goes through four kinds of seeds, seed by the wayside and the birds come, seeds by the, uh, uh, you know, on the, on, the, on the rough part or in, or, where they don't take root, and then there's seeds in the thorns where they're choked out and they don't bear fruit, and then there's seed that falls on good soil and it brings forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. He said, that's the one who hears the word. So this, this whole thing, this whole, this whole parable is about hearing. It's like the message, all right? Hearing, hearing. Am I hearing the Word of God? Now, even though this message contextually deals pretty much with a gospel word, it also has principles for us as believers of how we're hearing the Word of God. He said, you know, some seed in this parable, he says the seed is the Word of God, and the field that it's being sowed in is the hearts of men. He said, the, as the seed of God is being sowed, it goes out. And he says, some seed falls by the wayside. Now, in the context, I mean, that's a person who doesn't know God. He kind of hears the word, but he doesn't really hear the word. He may come to church. He goes in one ear out there. He may have a friend who's trying to share the gospel with him. He doesn't have time for it. He's preoccupied with the world. And so what happens? Satan comes and steals the seed immediately. All right? Boom. Takes it away. You have to realize, and it's a re, I know it's just repetition, but in this spiritual world, there is another force in operation. Satan hates you. And he doesn't want you to receive God's word. And you can be sure that if you don't listen to hear what God says to you, whether it's your Bible study time, your personal time, or coming to church, as soon as you walk out these doors, he's going to steal that seed from you. That God intended for you to hear so your life could be dynamically changed to bear fruit in great ways. All right? To, just, to radically change your life. The word of God has that kind of impact. But if you just dismiss it, it kind of goes in one ear, and you think, well, I did my time, you know. I got over with, so now I feel better. I went to church, praise the Lord. I'm just, you know. and that's reasoning and rationalization. And, and the word doesn't take root, you know. You've been robbed, all right? Satan rips you off. And there's a lot of people, because they want, oh, they kind of hit the surface, but they don't let it take, take root in their life. They don't hear it. That's seed by the wayside. You, you know, so you, the idea is, obviously, and that's parable, is to come and to know Christ and to walk with Christ, but to really hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to you in your life. So I want God to speak to me, all right? Adam, remember the garden? He heard God speak. And he, he also listened to the devil. And he was sold a bill of goods. God wants to rip you off, you know, you eat, you say, do this. And just like people today, isn't it interesting, after thousands of years, the devil hadn't changed the plan of attack at all? He just speaks a lie. He twists the truth. God wants to mess you up. God wants to ruin your life. You do that, you won't have any fun. You do that, it's going to mess you up. You do that, you won't enjoy your life. Devil, that's the same old lie. And remember what Adam says when the Lord says, Adam, where you are? And Adam says, you know, I heard your voice in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. That's the way it works sitting in church. God speaks a word to you, and you don't want to hear it because it exposes you. You ever felt that way? Oh, that one hurt. You know, that exposes me. I'm kind of feeling naked here before the Lord. I've been exposed. And so I just cover up, close my eyes, stop my ears up. I'm afraid. You don't have to be afraid of God, and you don't have to be afraid of God's Word. He's not going to wreck your life. Your life is already wrecked without Jesus. He's trying to do something so supernatural and powerfully off. You know, most people, they don't, they don't live in a supernatural dynamic, as we've said. They just live their life like that pinball machine and bumping off one table after another table. God wants to speak to you. I don't know if this is the part I'll just pass here right quick. It's good stuff. We can get it later. The next seed, stony places. I want them to see the rocky places. The man who heard, he, respe he takes, ah, I want that. But it, the roots never come out of the seed because death never takes place. 
right? The seed must fall on the ground and die, and then it bears, it bears, it puts down a root and bears. But this guy, it never, it never gets there. There's no, there's, there's, there's no root, all right? There's nothing to get a hold of. The root is where the plant receives the nutrients, right? Where it receives the life from the soil, and, 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 but it's not there. And it says, this guy, he's only temporary. There's a lot of people come to church like that. They never give their life to Jesus. They're temporary. You know, they, they come in, get on fire for a week, and, well, they're gone. Because they didn't really make a decision to follow Christ. They made a decision, I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> that decision, you know, save me. But this person, you know, he says, affliction and persecution arise. I used to read that as a young Christian. Persecution and affliction arise from the world. But is that what that says? Where's the persecution arise from? What's that word say? Persecution, affliction, they arise from the word because of the word. The word of God offends them. That call to live a holy life, the call to be a servant of Christ, the call to reach a lost world, the call to give your money, all that stuff is an offense to them. At church, all they want is my money. They don't receive the word of God. So it's, it's, a, it's a principle. Contextually, yes, somebody who hadn't received to get saved, but the principle is there. It's a hearing issue with this person. They're going to stay shallow in their life. The third seed was the one that, that fell among the thorns. Remember, it says, and the thorns choked them. The worries of the world, the deceitfulness of wealth, you know. So they don't become, they, they're, they're, they're not fruitful at all. They don't experience fruitfulness. This is carnal believers. Obviously, in this parable, it's someone who just goes through the motions, doesn't really receive Christ. But in the context that we can use, the principle of it is, is, is this, is that if we're going to hear the word of God, we can make sure that this stuff doesn't block God out. We make sure that we're not in love with the world. For if any man loved the world, what happens? The love of the Father is not in him. This is the kind of person who comes to church and he don't want to hear about money because he don't want to give money. Money is an issue, Jesus says. It becomes an issue. They're not going to give regularly. Proportionate. Oh, they'll drop some money in the offering box occasionally and do something here and there. And, you know, it's kind of like tipping the waitress. They'll tip God occasionally. But proportional giving and stewardship, that is not in their list. Why? Well, if I do that, I can't make If I do that, you know, I can't buy my lotto tickets. If I do that, I can't. They're being choked out. In here. They become, what is it, the worries of the world. What's that mean? I'm so busy with what the world has to offer. I've just got to stay. I can't come to church. I've got to do this. Oh, I've got to make more money. I need to take another job. No, it's Sunday, but, I, you know, Sunday, I just need, I need my money more than I need, you know, and it's just, oh, it's, I can't come to church. I think I need to put a few more hours in it. You know, I can't, I can't go to Bible study. You mean lift? I ain't got time for lift. You know, it's cares of this world. But tell you what, have them miss the kickoff in the Texans game, and that's a cardinal sin. Oh, come on, guys, loosen up. <laughs> you know, oh, I got I to gotta have my kid in baseball. My golly, my, everybody else's kid's in baseball. My kid needs to be in baseball. Listen, praise God, my son hated baseball. <laughs> it didn't become a big battle in our house. And I told him, if you want to play baseball, we're not going to play Sunday, and we're not going to play it on Wednesday. Can I get a witness? Now we're making folks stop their ears, aren't we? <laughs> What's important to your family? What's important to your life? And what do you want your kids to learn? Is God more important than baseball? How are they going to learn that? There's plenty of time for the things of this world. Because there are things in the world the world offers that are not sinful, all right? But they're not always the right choice. There's best and there's second. I prefer best. All right? I prefer best. And there's lots of opportunities to do stuff. But I think if I want to teach my kid God comes first, then God comes first. Period. And the fourth, this is the kind of here we want to be. Amen. The seed fell on good ground. What's that mean? That means that my heart is a broken heart. We've got so few broken people anymore. We need broken hearts before the Lord always. Humble hearts teachable hearts. Hearts that say, oh God, use me. Not me, Lord, but you. What did John the Baptist say? I must decrease that he might increase. That's the heart of a broken man, a broken woman. Says, I want God first. 
God in my life, his will, his ways, his plan, his purpose, because that's where I'm going to discover the truest meaning of all this. God, let you be the first thing in my life. I know these aren't fun sermons to listen to. Anybody having fun right now? <laughs> Amen. Now, unfortunately, not the sermons that are being preached in many places today. There's some. Praise God for them. But these are the messages that will transform your life. Walk you into a whole new sphere of living. And you'll discover a whole new sphere of influence. You know, here, here's something for you to do in your Bible study this week. For some reason, we quit working. There we go. You can email me the answer. What's that mean, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold? I mean, if I'm just obeying God and I only get 30-fold, how am I doing? If I'm on the least end of the spectrum, at least 30, and I'm making an investment into the kingdom of God, and I'm going to get whatever my investment is, 30-fold back, send me an email, tell me what that is. And the rest of them that won't do that, you're going to have to ask. I'm not telling you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, too, I'm, I'm too much giving you answers every week that you need to be finding out for yourself. I mean, ultimately, he's talking about a supernatural and abundant living. Now, here's the most important. This is, where, this is, how, this is what it means you're really hearing. Faith is responding to what you're hearing. This is the faith principle. Faith. What does the scripture tell us about hearing? It says faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. You, are, you sit back and say, I just need more faith. Get more in the word of God. Have ears to hear. You'll be a great person of faith. If you start listening, you'll be a great person. If you're acting on the word of God. So the hearing principle brings forth the fruit of faith in our life. So as, the more we listen the more faith we're exercising in our spiritual walk in life. The less, on the other hand, is, is true. Hebrews 4 says there was that group of people that didn't ex experience the promised land because, hey, they heard they, they heard what was preached to them. The good news, the promised land is waiting for us. Let's cross the Jordan. Let's go in. Hey, but it didn't profit them at all because they didn't, they didn't really hear it. All right? It was, not, it was not united with faith. It just kind of came in and went out on here. Faith says... I heard you, Lord. Here we go. Let's move forward. I heard what you said. I'm walking with Let's go. It's not trying to, oh, let me check it out. You know, let's be reasonable. <laughs> it's not my personality really to do that. You know, it's not me. No. What do you say, Lord? Let's do it. Those are the people who lie down at night and say, man, oh, man, oh, man, God is good. I can't believe how he's blessing me. God's good. And I'm experiencing in real time, in real space, abundant living. God has a plan. These are the, these are the systems and the principles and operation to help you discover it and be equipped. So hear what the Lord says and walk in it. Can I get an amen? amen? Let's stand with our heads bowed this morning. I just want to reiterate this morning why we do what we do at Believer's Fellowship. We preach the word so that your life might be changed. We preach the word so that God will be glorified. And we preach the word so you can hear clearly what the Lord says and what his word says. And probably anything I've said today, for the most of you, I wouldn't say, well, that was some great new revelation. It's stuff you knew in your heart, right? But the Holy Spirit has loved you enough to remind you and Perhaps take that little shepherd staff that the shepherd's leading me to hear his voice and give you a nudge with it. All right? And, and, and just prod you a little bit. So you respond to that. And believers fellowship. We give invitations. We open an altar so that we won't let the word be stolen from us, slip by the wayside, run, land on some hard place, but 
we can come to the altar and say, Lord, you spoke to me today. I hear this word from you, and I want to I want to embrace it, not let the enemy steal it. So God may have spoke to you about something today. Maybe a call to do something. Maybe telling you to stop something. Would you come to this altar this morning and humbly be before the Lord, just respond to him? Just come find a place to pray. Even now, you can slip out and come find a place where you can respond and say yes to the Lord. Or, Lord, um, forgive me for that. Or, Lord, give me grace to do that. But I'm opening my heart and life to you. If you know Jesus, then you come today and give your heart to Christ. Just come to any one of these men at this altar and say, I need to give my life to Jesus. Maybe there's a burden you're having today and you want somebody to pray. You can come to any one of us and pray. Maybe you're looking for a church home. This is where the Lord's been leading you. And you've put off making this decision. But if God's clear, clearly told you what it, he, you should be doing, then, then quit putting it off. Respond to him. Obey him. Commit and see what God does, how fruit will be produced from the seeds that are in your heart when you obey. Lord, we do love you. This time is your time. May you be glorified in it. In Jesus' name. Would you step out? Come. Let's respond to the Lord. Whatever the Lord's saying, whatever he's doing, we're here. Let's see what There's hope for the hopeless and all those who've strayed. Come sit at the table, come taste the grapes. There's rest for the weary and rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can
your heads for a moment longer would you and just music plays the spirit of god is speaking to hearts i pray that you haven't stopped your ears that you've inclined your ear today that you walk out of this building with a fresh approach to hearing god a new desire to be obedient as he speaks to walk in faith the bible says the just shall live by faith let that be the actions of our life i'm a man of faith you're a woman of faith you're not letting the world dictate to you or even your own feelings or your emotions. It's the Spirit of God I'm listening to. I am a spiritual person, first and foremost. We are spiritual people. We are a spiritual group. We are the church, the body of Christ. This is a place where God is moving and working, delivering, healing, touching, saving, granting grace. And all across this womb today, different people experiencing different things by the Spirit of God. Let yours be an open heart to receive what he's doing. Don't be resistant. Let it be a yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, we love you today. We brought our burdens and our hearts and our situations, our circumstances to you. And we're asking you, Lord God, that you'd give us a sensitivity to your Holy Spirit that's fresh and new and vibrant, a sensitivity to your word. We'd have the ears to hear, God, that the seed would bear fruit in our life as we respond to what you say to us. May you be glorified in us and through us for the glory of your son, Jesus Christ. In the precious name of Jesus, we thank you. And all the people said, amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Now, I don't see Miss Margaret here this morning, so I don't know what's going on, but I have missed the amens. So when she's not here, you're going to take the slack up, okay? Can, Amen. She what? Oh, uh, well, that's forgivable. Maybe. That's not the unpardonable sin, but Mississippi's close. No. <laughs> but amen. Listen, uh, we've got some work to do as this year approaches us. I'm excited about what the God has been putting in our hearts and in our minds for these weeks to come and the days ahead of us. So get ready, buckle down. We're going to see God do some awesome and supernatural things. You just need to have a willing spirit and a willing heart. Say, I want to be a part of what God is up to. Can I get an amen? amen. I want to be a part of what God's up to. And let's see how God uses each and every one of us. You know, I was talking to a pastor. We had a, a Thursday Magnolia community dinner. There was about seven pastors there, and they were all to every pastor saying, you know, our tens down 20%, our tens down 20% without fail. You know, one guy said, well, you know, I'm good friends with Paul Osteen, Lakewood. They're down 20%. Everybody's down 20%. I know misery loves company, but we're down about 20% here, folks, ever since the flood. And we, it's our responsibility to make disciples, all right? And I, pastor, one pastor said, what do you think the issue is? I said, I think the issue is, when the Bible calls us to make disciples, we just get our disciples and we keep making the same disciples disciples. And we've lost the last step of making disciples that once you've been made a disciple, in other words, you're growing, you're starting maturing, then you individually start making disciples. But we think we're going to be disciples and then we're going to let the pastor make disciples. Every one of you should be discipling somebody right now. Who are you discipling? All right, you got my message, all right? That, that's two sermons in one day, all right? So I'm expecting a big offering. No. <laughs> Amen. Gary, it's so glad to have you back. Amen. Don't y'all praise the Lord for Gary. As he's coming, go to that Christmas slide just for me. I'll say something about it while Gary's coming. You come on up. You can be seated here. Okay. Uh, not that one. Christmas. C-H-R-I-S-T-M-E-S. Offering slide. There's an offering slide that's going to come up. Let me just say a word. I'm going to say more about it in the weeks to come. This is our Christmas season, and it's Christmas season, you know, that we give to a special mission fund. Our church is very mission-oriented. Even we give money every month to the, the Baptist General Association for the state, Southern Baptist of Texas, and we give money to the cooperative program and to the G Southern Baptist Convention, and we're supporting tons and tons of schools, universities, seminaries, missionaries, cooperative efforts all across the globe, thousands of missionaries, and we support 
support that. But these offerings that we take up Christmas are not associated with those. This is for those personal missions that we specifically do ourselves, like with Gary going to Uganda, and Tim and Rebecca will be going to Senegal this year. We'll be going to, we'll be going to Cuba and to Belize and the pastor's conference, the mission trips. All that helps under, underscore and, and to make that happen. So I'm going to ask you to begin today to pray about what you would do over and above your regular tithes and offerings. And we do it at Christmas, at Christmas time for a very specific reason. And some of y'all don't know this, but this may be a surprise. Christmas is not your birthday. <laughs> I know you get the gifts and everything, but it's not your birthday. Whose birthday is it? Yes, it is. And so this is, this is the way we can give a Christmas gift to the Lord, all right? Just think of it that way. It's Jesus' birthday. I want to bring the Lord an honorable gift. And I know it's going to be the gift that he loves because it's going to people. He loves people. Final words make it clear. Go make disciples. This way we can help churches make disciples. We can disciple churches. We can lead them into deeper relationships and pastors and their wives. And, you know, it's, not, it's more than just going to a town and doing a revival. We're going in there and you hit 15, 20 churches. I mean, how many pastors were at this one little thing y'all did? Over 100 pastors. That ministry went out to 100. Those pastors today were in their pulpits preaching stuff that they picked up, you know, and learned. And we're talking. That, to me, that's just mind-blowing that we have that kind of ripple effect I, I, you know, the newsletter's coming out. I have a statement in the newsletter's coming out that says something like this. We're the biggest little church around. <laughs> Amen? Because of the impact. So be praying about what your Christmas offering is going to be. You can start by giving today or whatever, you know. Uh, but the biggest deal is we'll reach the need if you'll just give what the Lord tells you to give. So nobody's going to wind you up and make you give a certain amount. You ask God, and then here's the big kicker. Have ears to hear. Be inclined to hear what the Lord would speak to you. And honor the Lord with a Christmas gift this year like that. Hallelujah. Amen. So glad to have Gary back. Amen. 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 <laughs> Only a couple of announcements. So first one is Thanksgiving dinners and Lyft groups, youth and Awanas tonight. If you're not a part of Lyft and would like to join us, please pick up a flyer in the Lyft area uh, by the lobby for directions and time. Uh, their dinner might be in alternate locations today. Like I know one of our morning groups ate at Denny's. I think one of our lift groups is meeting immediately after church. And then I know my, uh, the Hanau lift group is going to Spring Creek. So you might want to get with the lift leaders before you just decide to show up. I want you to show up, but I want people to be there to receive you when you show up. So just make sure that you get with the lift leaders. A new lift study is coming up uh, December 2nd. It's called The Discipline of Grace. Uh, there's some information that will also be on the screen uh, in the coming days and weeks. No Wednesday night service this week. Also, the office will be closed on Thursday. From our families to yours, have a safe and blessed Thanksgiving. Christmas cards are in the um, foyer, and those are for the widows. Uh, we do have bread in the kitchen. And before I get to the offering slide, this is a, um, a tangible example of what the Christmas offering means. I received, I, was, I had the opportunity, the honor to preach in a church on Sunday. And uh, this was, I received this on Friday. It says, it's from Life Forever Church in Kampala, Uganda. It says to Pastor, to Pastor Gary Warren, it is a great pleasure working with you. We thank the Lord you, who enabled you to come and minister to us. We appreciate the entire ministry of the Believers Fellowship Church for the opportunity of supporting the man of God. We love you so much, Pastor. We wait to see you again. So this is an example of what your giving does. Those people love Jesus, and they love you. Um, and that was, that was, that's a message they wanted me to share with y'all. Finally, on our offering, and there's some pictures in the back. I'm sorry, I missed that. There's pictures on the back. We had the opportunity to share, and I'll share more next week when I have my mind right um, on my trip to Uganda and, and everything like that. Don't forget your tithes and offerings. Be sure to honor the Lord and worship him. We do not, we do not pass a plate. There are offering receptacles in the back. For those joining us on Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to go to our, our website and and, and, and or on share this link with your friends, but be sure to go to our website and click the Give button on the website to also honor the Lord with your tithes and offerings. Uh, one final announcement. If uh, Peggy can come join me here in the center. Erica, why don't you come with her so she's not alone with me? So she's not too embarrassed. This is Peggy Nastasi. 
and she gave her uh, life to the Lord uh, about a month and a half, two months ago. And today she has made the decision to join the church. Amen. Uh, so before you leave today, why don't we line up and just, uh, why don't we hug on, on Peggy and just tell her how glad we are to have her in our family. You are dismissed. Thank you.